Hi folks, everybody amazing. Today we're talking about Nickelodeon, the channel that had a huge impact on my generation in late 90s, early 2000s. It was the thing to watch. Uh, so many shows that uh, evoke nostalgia. However, as of late, a Discovery Channel a documentary has been uh, essentially shining a light on some of the things that were happening behind the scenes. The first episode primarily focused on Dan Schneider. And the second episode, which came out yesterday, focused on a situation that happened specifically with Drake Bell. And since then, Dan Schneider has actually responded to the content of the documentary. There is another third part that's coming out the day of the recording of this video. You will likely already have the opportunity to watch the third part if you're watching this video already. Uh, anyway, we're going to look at some highlights, see Dan Schneider's response, and... Yeah, let's check it out. And welcome back to The Factor Uncensored. The 90s are considered by many to be the golden age for Nickelodeon TV shows. A new documentary tells a different story, particularly about the alleged abuse some child actors suffered at the hands of showrunner Dan Snyder. Dan's treatment of people on his shows was an open secret. So my lawyer filed complaints, gender discrimination, hostile work environment, harassment, and it was so devastating. How safe can any kids be in that environment? There would be even bigger problems down the line with actual pedophiles on set. Wow. Multiple former child actors have spoken out in the documentary, including actor Drake Bell, who says he was sexually assaulted by his former dialogue coach, Brian Peck. There was also allegations against Jason Handy, a production assistant. Now, as far as the workplace situation with the female employees, uh, they describe being hired to be writers on The Amanda Show. They were hired by Dan Schneider. They were the only two female writers on staff. They allege that uh, Dan said that they were going to have to split one salary, which needless to say is absolutely insane. They also allege several situations which made them extremely uncomfortable. One of them, uh, they describe how during a writer's meeting, one of them was telling a story and Dan suggested that they tell the story while they were getting fucked. Another thing that one of them describes is how Dan liked to get shoulder rubs, shoulder massages. And in some occasions, he suggested that if she gave him a shoulder massage, that her sketch would be put on the show, which is absolutely strange and weird. Uh, they also highlight just strange behavior that Dan demonstrated during the shoots. Some of the child actors uh, talked about the content feeling demeaning and commented on how looking back on it there was a lot of sexual nuance to some of the jokes and uh, even some of the wardrobe that they wore anyway as far as drake bell's allegations uh his father actually saw this coming you hear scuttlebutt about the business and what you got to watch your kids and this and that so i was very attentive All the other parents would be seen and not heard, which I would never interrupt anything, but very rarely sat in the green room. I'd always be offset somewhere where I could always keep my eyes on Drake. And unfortunately, I started seeing Brian start to just hang around Drake too much. And it didn't, didn't set well with me. Drake would be in the dressing room or something and in would pop Brian and um, uh, just touch Drake. You know, do things that, wait a second, what are you doing? Drake can put that on himself. And the thing is, this is in front of people. Then he'd, he'd maybe walk over to Drake and be feeding him some lines or whatever and put his arm around his waist. Put his hand up on his shoulder and kind of run it down his arm and things like that. And this would happen routinely was just always uncomfortable. Oh yeah, and it gets worse, folks. Drake Bell from the show Drake and Josh revealing for the first time publicly that he is the John Doe victim in the 2003 child sexual abuse case against his dialogue coach, Brian Peck. Bell claims that Peck purposely isolated him from his father, who was also his manager. I think Brian got a sense that my dad was on the watch. And so he started to really drive a wedge between my dad and me. He started talking about 
how my dad's stealing my money. Nobody likes that my dad's on set. He's a real problem. I was believing it because he's been in this business for so long and he must know more than us. Peck was convicted in 2004, sentenced to 16 months in prison, and is now a registered sex offender. Bell says that abuse put him on a path of self-destruction, including two... Bro, the fact that this guy only got 16 months, and if I saw this correctly, I think he served only 10 of those months, it's absolutely insane. And not only is it absolutely insane, but there are a lot of letters in support of this guy, Brian Peck, that uh, um, a lot of really famous people signed letters in support of him. Some even said that he was tempted. I mean, how the fuck are you going to say an adult is tempted? According to Drake, what happened was uh, Brian had talked his parents into allowing him to spend the night at his place in between shooting days because... Uh, Drake's parents lived in Huntington Beach or Orange County. I don't know. It's like about an hour, an hour and a half drive away from Los Angeles and the studios. So Drake was spending one of those nights at Brian's place. And Drake was 15 and said that he woke up and Brian was sexually assaulting him. So that was the incident. And how the fuck is that tempting somebody? How is it? I, I, I don't understand. I, I mean, it's infuriating. To say the least, uh, none, as far as I know, none of the actors involved in supporting this convicted pedophile said anything since the documentary has been released. Also, it should be noted that shortly after he was released from prison, Brian Peck was hired by Disney to keep working with children. I mean, how fucked up do you have to be? You literally get a convicted sex offender and you're like, you know what? Why don't we just reintroduce them to the environment where they abuse and traumatize the child? How about we just put more kids at risk? Because one is clearly the loneliest number, so it seems. Nickelodeon saying in a statement, We are dismayed and saddened to learn of the trauma he has endured, and we commend and support the strength required to come forward. I can't even describe the feeling to know that there was a monster among among us. The actors were calling sketches written by Schneider's team like on-air dare. Yeah. Those were torture moments for all of us. Hearns dare had him covered in peanut butter and then licked by dogs. My Bro, what the actual fuck is wrong with these motherfuckers? What is wrong? This is so weird. This is so weird. There is absolutely no way other than seeing it as this is so weird like seriously there should never be a circumstance where a child is placed in a scenario that is sexually suggestive such as this one you're having their entire body covered in peanut butter you're having them lay there and dogs look at all of them what's the entertainment value here uh, 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 in, and we even see in the video that the kids are like i don't like this this doesn't feel good somebody get me out of here like I, I just want to know who the fuck greenlit this shit. I, I think that the chain of command from beginning to top, from where the idea came from, whoever had it, to whoever greenlit it, to whoever took part in this, like, everybody should just fucking stop. I mean, it's been already, like, 20-something years since this happened, so the damage has been done. It's unclear who is even still involved with kids programming. Dan Schneider has been removed from Nickelodeon since 2018. So... The damage has been done. And now all that's left is, uh, you know, learning this lesson and hopefully never allowing this shit to ever happen again. Anyway, speaking of Dan Schneider, he has published a video. It's a 20-minute video. We're not going to look at all of it. We're going to look at parts of it. But he uh, responded apologizing to these folks. Is there anything you'd like to start on? Absolutely. Watching over the past two nights was very difficult. Me facing my past behaviors, um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. Let's talk about the massage. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah. Dan, talk to me about the writer's room. From what I saw, not cool. 
No, no. And I, I don't mean to cut you off, but if I can cut right to the chase, let me just say, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room, ever, period, the end, no excuses. Um, most TV writers, comedy writers have been in writer's rooms and they are aware that a lot of times there are inappropriate jokes made and inappropriate topics come up. Uh, but the fact that I participated in that, especially when I was leading the room, um, it embarrasses me. I shouldn't have done it. Um, and, and I can tell you why it hurts really bad for me. Um, I remember very clearly my early experiences, my first experiences in the entertainment business. I was green, I was scared, I was excited. It, it meant the world to me that I was getting those opportunities. And I went in and I got lucky because they were great. My first couple of experiences were fantastic. And the fact that, and the fact that I didn't pay that forward to every employee that walked through my door, yeah. it, it, it hurts my heart because I should have. And I wish I could go back and fix that. Um, in the writer's room, there's no doubt that sometimes those jokes went beyond the pale and I said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far and um, that was wrong and that, that was because you know I was an inexperienced producer, I was immature, wouldn't happen today but um, I'm just really sorry it happened. Yeah. Now we know you've had a lot of success over two decades. Thousands of people have worked with you for you. Okay. Let's speak directly to the people who did not have a good experience. Okay, I would like to speak to those people because I hate that anybody worked for me and didn't have a good time. You know me. You've been on my set. Um, look, I've had some employees that have worked for me for 10 years, some more than 20 years, who would work with me again, but um, not everybody. There's a, still a significant number that didn't have a great time working for me. So Anyway, he goes on to address uh, other things. He talks about the, uh, the situation with Drake Bell and how he when he found out, distanced himself from that uh, dialogue coach. He talks about the Amanda Bynes emancipation situation and shares his side of the story. I don't really, like I said, I don't really have 20 minutes to sit here and comment on everything that's happening with this guy. Uh, I think that those first three minutes are truly most of really what you need to get out of this because it, 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 the rest of the video is just him explaining you know, his side of things. Uh, I, I I have a pretty middle of the road opinion when it comes to that whole documentary, which just makes his whole statement confusing to me. Uh, I, I personally think that that documentary does expose a lot of really awful things that genuinely happened. But at the same time, there is a whole aspect of salaciousness and really trying to pin a whole hell of a lot of stuff on... Uh, Dan Schneider, which is actually unclear whether or not he even signed off or was able to sign off on some of this stuff. And he even touches upon this as far as the inappropriate jokes uh, and it, all of them being pinned on him as though that was just solely his brainchild. I mean, this is a room with, I don't even know how many writers, like back in that day, a writer's room could be between 12 to 20 people, maybe even more. I don't fucking know. Nowadays, they're much smaller. But the fact that the inappropriate jokes I, thing is just being completely pinned on him is just it seems weird because there are so many departments when it comes to a sitcom like that or any sort of tv show especially a show on nickelodeon there's like a massive production around, around it you have quality control you have producers you have everybody's reviewing it and nitpicking everything and you know allowing things to go and not allowing things to go also as far as inappropriate jokes on kids shows if we're going to call out dan schneider we got to just Make sure that we call out Disney and every other kid's content creating company out there because they all delve into the inappropriate joke territory. Even Pixar does this. There's a reason why there's that saying when they're promoting movies that there's a little bit of something for everybody out there. That implies that there's content and story for children, but at the same time, there's subversive humor or double entendres, or jokes that are meant for adults that kids aren't going to understand. And trying to just paint this with a broad brush and say that Dan Schneider was the only one, you know, putting those jokes in there, like he's a fucking creep, and, da -da -da -da, and he wanted to just molest these kids. Like, it, it just takes what is a regular practice in kids' programming and dates back years. You can go to the fucking Lion King, the original one, and to see those jokes in there. You go to fucking Aladdin, the original one, and see those kinds of jokes in there, and nobody has a problem with this. All of a sudden, they're acting like Dan Schneider created this kind of uh, 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 shit, you know? And if we're going to have a problem with Dan Schneider doing this 
on Nickelodeon shows. We got to have a problem with this happening on Disney shows as well. Instead of just trying to pin all of this on one man, this, you know, creative choice that a lot of people who make kids programming choose to do. That in and of itself and the reframing of a lot of jokes of like, you know, a nose sneezing and it being a cum shot, a, a lot of that felt like a reach in the documentary. At the end of the day, like saying that a sneeze and phlegm or, or snot flying out and hitting somebody in the face, that, that's, you know, the, the writers inserting a subversive cum shot in there. It, it's just like, it's such a, an insane reach to me. And, and the documentary having those moments coupled with all the awful shit that they're talking about only takes away from the credibility of the awful shit that they're talking about because it, it, it feels like a hit piece. It, it honestly feels like they're just throwing as much as possible and trying to just say that Dan Schneider is this like gangster fucking insane mastermind behind all this awful shit. No, this is like a 30 to 50 person production. This is an entire network. If we're going to hold somebody accountable, he's the face of it. Sure, that's fine. Have him be the godfather of this shit. But the operation around him is what enabled all this shit to happen and vastly contributed to all this shit. If we're going to ignore the operations that are causing this shit, then we're just going to symbolically destroy one person while ignoring the larger issue at hand here. And how can the conversation be so focused on this man when there's a legitimate evidence that a guy, the guy who molested Drake Bell, was convicted, and then shortly after that, hired by Disney. Why is nobody going after Disney? It's just, uh, there are a lot of things around this documentary that seem inconsistent. It seems like they're really trying to pin everything on him. They show no evidence that he's the guy who approved the splitting of the salary between the one salary between the two female writers. That could have very much have come up from the chain. It could have come from HR. It could have come from an executive producer, somebody above him. There's just a lot of claims that are made, some of them by some very dishonest journalists, and it all gets coupled and thrown on top of this man. And again, I'm not saying this to defend him. I'm just saying that all this just takes away from the credibility of the documentary overall because there's so much piling on and you're like, and you're like watching this and you're like, in one moment you're like, this is genuinely awful. And then on another moment you're like, this isn't much. Why are they just making such a huge deal out of this? Anyway, all that being said, his apology, I, I don't even know why the fuck he's apologizing. Who is he even apologizing to? It's so broad and... and it, there, I don't know what is even supposed to be achieved with this apology. It, 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 there's nothing that can actually be remedied with the apology. Who, whose life is going to change? The only way that this documentary can have an impact or that anything can come out of it is if the people who feel like they were victimized end up suing Dan Schneider or Nickelodeon or something and get some kind of payout out of it. And outside of that, if some kind of legal protections are put into place, to ensure the safety of children on these sets, to ensure that if you are a sex criminal, if you are a, a, a registered sex offender who's primarily abused children, that you're not getting to work with children on set. Like, we, we have that where pedophiles can't be near a school. Like, why the fuck would they be getting hired to work on set with children? These are just a couple of things that I think could be easily done and could actually have a tangible positive effect moving forward so that this never happens again you know if anything this documentary is a lesson on uh, how kids productions should not operate and if we're really going to go for something beyond just a salacious dramatic representation of these awful events in these people's lives then we have to have some ultimate actionable goal that will lead to change and prevent this from ever happening again to somebody else the Coogan Law exists as a result of what happened to Jackie Coogan. There's absolutely no reason why there can't be some kind of measure that protects kids on set from that kind of abusive behavior that they all feel like they experienced. Anyway, folks, you tell me what you think in the comments down below. I love every single one of you. Hope you have a terrific day. Peace.